fine to see Miss Hightower. Miss Hightower, it is so good seeing you in the Lord's house. She's been struggling with a number of challenges, and I just want to... Every time, that, see, I, every time I come to the Lord's house, I look at that seat. Amen. And we're thankful that he allowed her to make it back one more time. It's good seeing all of you in the Lord's house. But we ask if you choose not to come to the front and you stand at your seat or sitting at your seat, that you would reach out and just hold someone by the hand. And this is our indication of letting us know that we're not walking this journey by ourselves. And we're all fellows in the ship. If you declare to be a believer in Jesus the Christ. But if you're not saved. If you do not have a love, trust, personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And you're holding someone's hand. We pray when the word go forth. That the Holy Spirit will convict your mind. Convert your heart. And compel you to respond. To the good news of Jesus Christ. Because he desired that you become a part of his body which is the church. And so with bowed heads and lifted up hearts, let us go to God in prayer. Dear God, we come now, and Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to adore you, to praise you and to thank you, to worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to be a testimony by our presence in the Lord's house that testifies that I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. And I know that I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who compels me to get up in the morning. That draws me, that says that because I value God, because I value Jesus, because I value what he did on Calvary for me, because I value that God raised him from the dead, I value salvation, I value his forgiveness, I value his unconditional love, I, I run to the Lord's house with the spirit of thanksgiving, thanking you, Lord, for loving me so much. Because I realized how deeply you loved me over 2,000 years ago while I was in my most unlovable state. I come to say thank you. Come through the gates with the password, thank you. The attitude of thank you. Lord, if you don't do anything else for us, yes, you've done enough. So I come offering worship come offering praise, I come offering thanksgiving because you're worthy to be praised. Bless now the hands that are being held. Bless in a mighty way. Bless us, O oh Heavenly Father, to be loving to one another, to be kind to one another because when we are kind to one another, we bless you. When we're loving to one another, we bless you. When we're forgiving of one another, we bless you. So Lord, we come now praying your blessings upon each and every one of us. Bless us with peace that surpasses all understanding. Continue to bless us with our health and our strength. Continue to sustain us over the the weeks, the months, and the years. Bless now. Bless this church continuously. That we will do your will, your way, by your word. Lord, we know that we're not perfect. But we pray that you will give every one of us a desire to do what we do for the love of God through Jesus Christ. Because we come to realize it's not about us, but it's all about you. We pray those with hard hearts, Lord, you will plow up their hearts those who are resentful, those who are, 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 are struggling with hostility, those who are struggling with anger, they're locked in their past. Lord, plow up their hard hearts. Allow them to experience your compassion. Allow them to experience your peace, your love. That they may too show love. Bless right now. Bless our homes, bless our families. Bless those in nursing homes, bless those in hospitals, and bless
bless those in rehabilitation centers. Lord, we pray your blessing upon them right now. Those in hospital rooms, those who are at home and they're sick, we ask your blessing upon them. Lord, we thank you for those. You're showing your faithfulness to those who are at home sick and now they return back to the Lord's house. As a testimony of your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. A testimony of your power. A testimony of your faithfulness. We thank you for their return. Now, Lord, we ask as the word go forth this morning that you will move on someone's heart and mind that they will hear a word of conviction, they will hear a word of comfort, they will hear a word that will move them, compel them to come to you. Those who are not committed and as dedicated, we pray that they will desire to be committed and dedicated to your body us in peace keep us in harmony is our prayer it's in the precious and glorious name of Jesus we pray let every heart and mind say amen amen, amen. amen. and amen as you return back to your seat we're going to ask you to lift up your voices I need if you would just lift up your voices the Say that one more time. I need anybody need him this morning. The, oh, if you need him, raise your voices. I need every, every, every hour. Somebody need him every second. I need somebody need him in the hospital. Oh, Somebody need him in the marriage. Me. Somebody need him in 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 in, in the church right now. And I come. I come to to the.
five.
this morning God's goodness woke you up this morning God's grace allowed you to get out of the bed this morning so let's not get it twisted it wasn't your goodness God's goodness God's mercy allowed you to put one step before another God's goodness God's grace Allowed you to come through that operation procedure. It's God's goodness. God's mercy. God's grace. Allowed you to go to that job that you have. Continue to provide for your day in and day out. God's goodness. God's grace. Allowed you to come through chemotherapy treatment, radiation treatment. God's goodness. God's mercy. God's grace allowed you to ride up and down the highway. God's goodness, let's not get it twisted. God's mercy kept you all week last week. Kept you from the dangerous seen and unseen last night. God's goodness, God's mercy, God's grace has allowed you to come through the valley of the shadow of death and still keep your, your sane mind. Is there anybody in this house? If you can talk to me, talk to me if you can. God's goodness. God's right. I don't know if I've come down your avenue yet, but, but that's why that's why I shed tears because it's not tears of sadness, but it's tears of joy. Because I realize it's God's goodness. It's God's grace. That's reason to give him thanks. Now, if you don't believe that God has done anything for you, just keep sitting there as if he's done nothing. Let me just go ahead and say this. Can I just go ahead and give you an opportunity to praise him just in case you don't praise him? If God hasn't done anything for you, I want you to remain seated. If God hasn't done anything for you, I want you to remain seated. Now, if you're not able to stand, raise your hand. There you go. If God hasn't done anything for you, Even if you don't have a relationship with him, I just want you to know his goodness and his grace has been preserving you. Thank God for your praise to God this morning. Amen. Tell the person next to you, I'm so thankful for God's goodness and God's grace. I've got to preach. Come on, you all be seated this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God for all that he has done. Thank you, choir, for reminding us of God's goodness and God's grace who've kept us. Thank you for worshiping choir. Thank you. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. I want to ask if you would just go with me quickly to Luke the 12th chapter. Luke, 12, Luke, the, 12th, Luke the 12th chapter. The gospel according to Luke. Chapter number 12. And I want us to look at this parable that Jesus was teaching at that time, we're going to start with verse number 13. Luke, the 12th chapter, verse number 13. Amen. Luke, 
chapter number 12, verse number 13. Everybody's there? Amen. If you have it on your cell phone, uh, just go ahead and pull it up on your cell phone, your iPad, or your whatever device you have that you carry the Bible around on. It's all right. Just don't candy crush, don't text. You know, if you're going to text, go ahead and do an Instagram and say, I'm at the Fourth Street Missionary Baptist Church. And the pastor is about to give not only his title, but he's just given his passage of scripture of the chapter he's going to come on, come out of. Amen. So it's all right to do that. Amen. Go ahead and let your best friends know and let those on Twitter know that I'm in church at 745. Amen. We're having a hallelujah good time. You ought to be here with me. Radio listening audience, we thank God for your tuning in. We're at Luke chapter number 12, verse 13. He says, and I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. He says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man who made me a, a judge, an arbitrator over you, and he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Amen. And I want to use as a sermon title based upon the sermon text and the sermon scripture verses and chapter. And I want you to just write this down. I want you to listen to this. What does Jesus teach about true happiness? What does Jesus teach about true happiness? Would you like to be happy? That's the question. People go out and buy happy books. They listen to happy songs. And their authors were making millions and millions of dollars on how to be happy. And perhaps you are. But Jesus teaches us how to be truly happy. So my brothers and sisters, what does it mean to be truly happy? Now, every person desires true happiness. Would you not agree? It is the quest of every human being, regardless of culture, country, or religion. The longing for happiness lies deep in the heart of everyone. Yet, Few find true happiness. Why? Why do all search for and desire true happiness, but so few find it, keep it, and live it? Could it be that we search in the wrong places? The things we think will bring happiness actually don't. Many millionaires have declared that they thought money could, be to, could buy them happiness just to be disillusioned 
How many have walked the aisle in marriage believing that the result would be true happiness? Only to be disappointed as their, 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 their many expectations could never be met. Others have thought that success would bring happiness and yet only brought depression. No one can say that true lasting happiness has been found through money, marriage, sport, knowledge, or fame. It may have brought some temporary pleasure, but not lasting happiness. So the search for true happiness can be like chasing the wind and, uh, or trying to hold water in your hands. It is elusive. No wonder crowds of people would follow Jesus and sit and listen to his words because he spoke about true happiness and lasting peace and joy. Are you interested? So number one, this is what Jesus taught about true happiness. But one, I want to just go ahead and distinguish. There are two types, two kinds of happiness. There is a temporary happiness. And this comes to us when the circumstances are just right when things are pleasant and we are free of troubles and as we all know this can never last circumstances can change in an instant and with them happiness evaporates if we were really truthful even in ideal circumstances happiness can be missing person can have everything going all right and still be unhappy. We can still be troubled within. We are still unsettled about our children, our future, our finances, or relationships. Something eludes us. The happy moment we experience still seems to fall short of what we long for deep within. This first type of happiness is only temporary and shallow. It always disappears and the desire for true happiness still remains. So many people trying to find happiness in the bottle. So many people trying to find happiness in, in the pipe. So many people trying to find happiness in titles. So many people is trying to find happiness in all the wrong places. But there is a happiness that comes from God. Let me say that again because there are some people say, I really don't want to hear about all that. Tell me how I can get rich. Tell me if I can find me a job. Tell me if thy health is going to get better. I don't want to hear about no God. I want you to tell me how I'm going to, 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 to get my marriage on the right track. Is there anybody in the house? But there is a happiness that comes only from God. And it is a happiness that lasts. It brings an inner peace regardless of circumstances. Don't miss that. No matter what situation or difficult circumstance that we face, and we all face difficult circumstances, true happiness remains. In fact, it can even grow stronger in adversity. I know that sounds absolutely crazy to the unsaved person, to the immature Christian, but I just come to, to let you know those of us who declared washed in the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of adversity, happiness can grow. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. The happiness through, don't miss this, the happiness through, 
Jesus the Christ is a contentment that fills the soul. Even if the eyes are filled with tears, true happiness is not based on success. Don't miss that young people. Don't miss that young adults. Don't miss that adults. Don't, don't miss that golden ages. Happiness, true happiness is not based on success or failure, wealth or poverty, fame or obscurity. As we focus on Jesus in our text for today, we will learn what he taught on true happiness. So the first point was the two kinds of happiness. Temporary and that which is lost, lasting. But here's the second one. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus does. Jesus dispels the myths that society say will bring happiness. Say that again just in case you missed it. Jesus dispels the myths that society say will bring happiness. Are you interested? Here's the secular general attitude, society, culture. The general attitude of society is that being wealthy will solve every problem and that if every problem is solved, we will be happy. If the truth be told, all of us have been influenced by that myth. Just listen to the conversation in the lunch room of a workplace. Y'all want to tune in to it? It goes something like this. How are you today? I'll be great if I win gold lotto. If I can hit the big cash. If I can hit that million. I would be absolutely okay. You look troubled. Nothing that a million dollars won't fix. And I just come by to tell you, Jesus dispelled this kind of thinking and said that a person's life does not consist in the abundance of his or her possessions. Listen to what Jesus teaches in Luke chapter number 12, our text, verses 13 through 21. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possessed. Then he spoke a parable to them. He, he's speaking spiritual truth in a story. And he's saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plenty. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater ones. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And, and I will say to my soul, here's what he said. Now, he's having a conversation with his soul. He said, I'm going to say to my soul, soul, <laughs> you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, unwise one, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. So in other words, the man in this story felt that material possessions, like so many people, 
equaled peace and happiness. He felt that he had arrived like so many people feel today in our culture, even within the church, they feel as though that they have arrived because they have the good job, they have the big house, they have all of the material possessions. They feel as though they have arrived. The problem was that his focus on wealth and possessions had blinded him to eternal and spiritual realities. Jesus also said in Matthew Chapter 6, verse 21, listen. Where your treasure is, somebody been reading the Bible, there your heart will also be. In other words, whatever you value, that's what you do. Whatever you value, that's what you pay the most attention to. His heart was in the things he had accumulated his earthly treasures. But look at what the rich man thought was in Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 19. There it is. Look at what he thought. The rich man said, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He had no heavenly treasure. Therefore, he had no heart for God. And his life. Many possessions have brought about an invincibility to his thinking. Jesus made it clear that to put material possessions ahead of spiritual well being is foolish. Let that sit. Because that challenges our naming and claiming theology. That challenges that God wants everybody to be rich. Now let me just go ahead and dispel a myth. God is not against money or wealth. Let me just go. You don't have to be a poor Christian. But let me just go ahead and tell you this. If you have been blessed with material things by God, first of all, it's not for you. Primarily. He wants to use you and bless you that you become a blessing to somebody else. Is there anybody in this house? It's not just to be used for you. It's to bless his church. Turn to the person and say, hello, church. It's to bless his ministries. To bless the cause that he has assigned by his kingdom to the church. Jesus made it clear that to put material possessions ahead of spiritual well-being is foolish. Fool, this night, your soul will be required of you. Now, for some people who God has blessed, that doesn't mean you have to feel guilty for, for God blessing you. You don't have to feel guilty about that. That's not what this sermon is about. The sermon is about that we must prioritize. We must keep wealth. We must keep riches. We must keep God's blessings in perspective, in the right perspective. But when we find ourselves loving money more than we love the master, he says, fool, your soul will be required of you. When we find ourselves Loving land more than we love the Lord. He says, fool, your soul will be required of you. So what can we learn from Jesus' teaching in this story? The teaching we can learn is you cannot put a price on a soul. Let me just go ahead. And say, you cannot put a price on a soul. You know why? Because it belongs to God. Money and possessions cannot add one second to our life. Once we have died, our earthly possession hold no value to us. Let me just go ahead and tell you, the moment that you are called home, they're going to come on somebody, they're going to say, send, call whatever funeral.
funeral home, they're going to come and pick you up, put you on, come on somebody, going to put you on a stretcher, they're going to embalm you, dress you up real pretty, and they're going to bring you to the Lord's house, and they're going to say some good things about you, and then they're going to take you whatever designated plot that you paid on over the years, they're going to say some good things over you there, and then your family's going to come back to the Lord's house, and they're going to eat chicken and Come on, somebody. They're going to eat chicken, potato salad, green beans. The family's going to fellowship, and, 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 and they're going to enjoy your stuff. Tell the robbers of the grave, you ain't nothing in there. Say anybody, about they're going to take your diamond rings. No blink trucks are going to follow behind. Your bank account not gonna follow behind. She may have make sure you got treasures stored up in heaven. They are worthless. We come into the world with no possessions and I just come by to tell you, we will leave in the same way. So we must find happiness and contentment in what we can take with us when our soul is required of us. How much did you love? That, that, that gets deposited. Is there anybody in the house? How, how were you kind of? That gets deposited. Is there anybody? How did you talk to people? That, that gets deposited. Is, is there anybody? How much did you love coming to worship me? That gets deposited. Is there? How much did you really serve others than yourself? That gets deposited. How many, did you, how many times did you go and witness on my behalf? How many times did you allow me to lead somebody to Christ through you? That gets deposited. Fool, your soul will be required of you. This, this is why we must find true happiness and contentment apart from earthly possessions. Many of us are worried about the opinions of others. But we must firstly be concerned that we are not a fool in God's opinion. Jesus said, so is he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. And I just come by to ask you the question that just, just to meditate on, just to reflect on, how can we be rich toward God? How can we be generous toward God? I'm glad you asked. Jesus is teaching it in this parable right here. So this is first understood by what, is, what it costs Christ. Don't miss that. What it costs Christ to restore us to himself. Grace is not cheap. Is there anybody in this house? He gave his best just for you. God the Son being equal and one with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit offered himself to become a man. Yet the price he paid went further. And as he made himself of no reputation and lived as a servant, he paid the full cost by laying down his life even until the death of the cross. He loved you. He valued you that much. He treasured us so much that he purchased us, not with silver, not with gold, not with money, not with cash, but with his own precious blood. That's why we keep saying the blood still works. God has declared the value of an eternal soul, his life. For us to be rich towards God, we must put the same value on our soul and place it in his hands. Come on, somebody. You need to place your soul in the hand of God. How do you do that? You need to make sure that you accept him as your personal Savior and Lord. We give ourselves fully to him. That's why we sing the song, we give ourselves away. I surrender all, putting him and his life above all else. 
the apostle Paul expressed how to be rich towards God this way. Listen at Colossians chapter number three. You ought to write it down, verse one through five. Listen at what he says. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are what? Above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. That's a shift in mindset for the Christian. For you died and your life is hidden where? With Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear in his glory. Therefore, Paul says, put to death your members. <laughs> this, this flesh which are on the earth. Here it is, put to death fornication. Put to death uncleanness put to death passions that only serve you put to death evil desires put to death covetousness that means comparing and want what everybody else want we used to call it wanting what the Jones want is there anybody in this house now we call it empire now we call it revenge now we call it is there anybody in this house loving hip hop all of that is covetousness breeds jealousy breeds idolatry so my brothers and sisters if you truly want to be rich towards God you want to put your soul in his hands but lastly another false belief is this the advice most people give is to look after number one you do you and I'm going to do me. And it's made its way into the Lord's house. It's made its way into the thinking of so many professed believers in Christ. I got to look after me. I got to take care of. Because if you don't put yourself first, no one else what? Will. But listen to what Jesus says in Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 39. Jesus, again, contradicts this kind of thinking. Listen to what he says. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever denies and desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it for what profit is it to man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul or what will a man give in exchange for his soul for the son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he will reward each according to his works so the bible says if you're going to truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ he says deny yourself don't put yourself above other people he says think of others more than you think of yourself and then he says you will come on somebody you will begin to think like Jesus think you begin to act like Jesus acts so I just come out and ask you what does Jesus teach about true happiness and if you're true want true happiness he says my peace I've given unto you not as the world gives it but as I give it unto you but then John 15 around about the 10th and the 11th verse he says my joy I give in complete is there anybody in this house he says I don't give joy I don't give true happiness 
partially but the joy that I give the true happiness that I give is given completely and I don't take it away Satan can't take this joy away Satan can't steal this joy away the Bible says that he wants us to put our soul in his hands and Satan not even powers cannot snatch it out of the hands of God he's too powerful is there anybody in this house and he doesn't give something and take it back away my God is not an Indian giver he won't give you something and take it away again so you have to be sure that you have his true happiness in come on somebody in you do you just have uh, the temporary happiness uh, as long as things are going all right uh, as long as things are being taken care of. You can have this kind of happiness, but when things start falling around you, when people become mean to you, the Bible says you can still have his joy. A matter of fact, over in John 16, around verse 33, he says, my peace, my joy, come on somebody, my true happiness I've given to you. You're going to have trials, you're going to have tribulations but when you truly know that you have the true happiness of God through Jesus Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit you ought to look at that particular passage he says this is how you respond when you have this true happiness when you have this true joy he says be of good cheer I know that messes somebody up he says be of good cheer even in your trials even in your tribulations when you truly have the true happiness of God the measure is can you still be of good cheer can you still come to the Lord's house and give the Lord praise can you still come to the Lord's house and say thank you Lord even you have your trials and your tribulation even if you can't pay your bills can you still come to the Lord's house and say thank you if you don't know where your next meal's coming from can you still come to the Lord's house and say thank you come on somebody if you don't know where the money's gonna come from to pay your child's tuition can you still come to the Lord's house and say thank you when you just lost your job can you still come to the Lord's house and say thank you when you just got diagnosed with cancer and you gotta go through chemotherapy can you still come to the Lord's house and say thank you when you truly have this happiness you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and say thank you because my happiness is not based on my happenings my happiness is not based upon the changing of my circumstances when you truly have this happiness you can come into the heart's house and say hallelujah praise his holy name I adore you I worship you I thank you for all that you continue to do is there anybody in here who truly have his true happiness that you can praise him in spite of you can praise him come on somebody is there anybody in here who want to give God praises and everything is falling around you things are not going so good but your focus is on the true happiness that God himself has promised his children I just come by to tell you if you do not have a true happiness of God through Jesus Christ he wants you to have true happiness. Well, you may ask, Reverend Flakes, how do I receive the true happiness of Jesus Christ? I'm glad you asked because I only have one story that I can tell you. I only have 
one solution to your unhappiness. I only have one solution to your temporary happiness. I only have one solution for you to receive the true happiness of Jesus Christ. And you may be asking, what is that? You must believe he came down through 42 generations conceived in the womb of a virgin called Mary by the Holy Spirit. You must believe he went to a hill called Calvary and gave his hands to the nails, gave his feet to the nails. If you truly want his true happiness, you must believe that he prayed a prayer just for you. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You must believe he locked his head in his shoulder and gave up the ghost. You must believe Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate, requested his dead body, put him in a bar or tomb. You must believe he stayed there all Friday night. If you truly want true happiness, you must believe he stayed there all Saturday and all Saturday night. And here's the good news. Here's the crescendo. Here's the hallelujah. Here's the thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sunday morning, he was raised from the dead with all power. Oh, all power in his hands. If you truly want true happiness, you must believe he was raised from the dead with all power. Now sits on the right hand throne of the Father. And one of these old days, he is coming back again. But unto then, we come to give him praise. We come to give him thanks. We come to worship him. We come to glorify him and we live out his happiness through our lives under the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit do not be fools and allow Satan to blind you with materials with titles with possessions because one day your soul will be required of you. So if there's someone here this morning and you know that you only have temporary happiness, you've been trying to fabricate happiness by going on cruises. And it's all right to go on cruises. I want to go on cruises too. But cruises do not give you the true happiness that only Christ can give. Some have tried to fabricate happiness by avoiding people. But I just come by to tell you, avoidance of people do not bring true happiness. Some people try and fabricate happiness by just trying to think positive. But I just come by to tell you, positive thinking don't bring about true happiness. The only way that you can experience the true happiness of God through Jesus Christ, you must be. You've got to be. Born from above. Must be born by the word of God and an act of the Holy Spirit. And we extend that invitation to you right now. Unashamed. Unembarrassed. There are so many Christians who come in and out of the Lord's house and they're so miserable. They're so unhappy. And they think that they can change it. And I just come by to tell you, you can't. But Jesus can. If you put your soul in his hands, if you enter into a love, trust, obedient relationship with him, and he will provide for your every need, according to his riches and glory.